Chapter 26, A Security Zone of the Future For the past five evenings, Nikolai Ivanovich, the warden of a maximum security correctional facility, in plain language, a prison, had not been able to leave his office at the usual time. When his workday officially ended, he turned his telephone ringer off and began pacing his office deep in contemplation. Occasionally, he would sit down at his desk, pick up the green folder lying on it, and peruse its contents for the umpteenth time. A convict serving time for an infraction of Article 93, Clause 1 of the Criminal Code of the Russian Federation had put forward a petition to him on behalf of a group of inmates in cell 26, with what at first glance looked like an unthinkable proposal. The convict, whose name was Kodakov, proposed acquiring for the facility a hundred hectares of abandoned or unused arable land to be surrounded by a barbed wire fence with a watchtower at each corner. In other words, taking all due precaution to prevent escapes. On this fenced in hundred eight hectar hundred hundred hectares ninety prisoners would be engaged in agricultural labor. The applications of those interested were kept in a file in this green folder. In their applications, these prisoners committed themselves to supply the whole facility with vegetables, to the tune of a half of all the produce they grew on the land. The other half they asked to be sent to their families. So far, nothing impossible in their request. In various correctional facilities, prisoners are engaged in manufacturing activity. In some cases, this involves crafting simple objects in woodworking shops. In others, organized textile production. Where prisoners sew simple items of clothing, such as quilted jackets or underpants, and receive a nominal wage for their work. The low wage is also due to the rather low level of productivity involved. According to the proposal in the file, the prisoners wanted to take up agriculture. Well, no problem there either. A payment of half of their produce was entirely feasible. No need to bother with selling stuff or shipping off products on consignment and then waiting months for the proceeds to come in. But that wasn't all. Kodakov, on behalf of the other prisoners, asked that the hundred hectares be divided into one hectare plots, each plot to be, to be assigned to a specific prisoner. In addition, they asked that each prisoner be granted the right to build a one-room cell hut on their, pl on their plot. There was also a request that any prisoner who wished to be allowed to stay on their land after serving their sentence, and then for the prison not to collect a, a levy but to, pr to purchase surplus produce from them, as well as to allow them to enlarge their dwellings. The file containing the proposal or request had been given to Nikolai Ivanovich as far back as six months ago. Along with the ninety applications and the text of the proposal, the file also included plans for the future plots, handsomely executed in colored pencil. The drawing showed the watchtowers, the barbed wire, and the controlled entry point. After his initial reading, Nikolai Ivanovich tucked the green folder away in the bottom drawer of his desk. From time to time, he would mentally go over its contents, but he had, but he had not given any answer to the prisoners. A certain circumstance had come about, however, which caused the warden to spend every evening over the past five days in intensive contemplation of the prisoners' proposal. An order had come from the National Administration to take steps, beginning the following year to enlarge the facility and construct additional cells with a view to being, already, to being ready to accept 150 new convicts by the year's end. The order was accompanied by plans for additional wards to be attached to the existing buildings, along with a financing schedule. It was proposed to use prisoner labor in the construction. Nikolai Ivanovich mused as follows. The financing will be delayed as usual, and there will be problems procuring low-cost materials. They put one cent of prices for construction materials into the budget, but when it comes to the actual building, it's something else already. Prisoner labor is never very efficient. The order is patently impossible to carry out. 
but there was no question that it had to be carried out. Nikolai Ivanovich's retirement was only five years away. He had already attained the rank of colonel. He had been the warden of the f this facility for twenty years now without a single black mark on his record, and now this order. But these concerns were not uppermost in the colonel's deliberations. The green folder. In his memo, prisoner objective of incarcerating prisoners in such institutions, namely rehabilitation. The fact that modern correct correctional institutions seldom succeed in their rehabilitation efforts. Indeed, quite the contrary. They end up producing more experienced criminals. Was not lost on Nikolai Ivanovich. If this were not so, you wouldn't get them coming back to prison for the second or third time. Nikolai Ivanovich had given a great deal of time and energy to his calling and was extremely disturbed by the situation. His life was getting on now. His terms of service was coming to an end. And what was there to show for it? A nursery for criminals, as it turned out. The green folder. How infectious it was. If only he could confidently conclude that there was something unacceptable in the proposal the file contained. But no, something inside him would not let him re reject it out of hand. But neither could he bring himself to fully support it. It was an offbeat, unconventional proposal. The next morning, the colonel's first order of the day was to have prisoner Kodakov from cell 26 brought to his office. You can take a seat, Mr. Kodakov, said Nikolai Ivanovich to the man who had just come in, accompanied by an escort guard. The warden gestured to a chair. I've just been looking over the contents of your file. I have a specific question for you. Sir, the prisoner hastened to reply, getting up from his chair. Sit, the guard commanded. Yes, do sit down, the prison warden replied softly. No need to jump to your feet the way they do in court. Turning to the escort guard, he added, You can wait for us outside. So, Sergei Yurovich Kotakov, I must say you've submitted a rather strange proposal. It only seems strange on the surface. In fact, the proposal is extremely reasonable. Then tell me directly, flat out, what kind of cunning plan have you thought up here? Are you aiming to set up the conditions for a mass escape? The ninety candidates applying are all serving sentences of between five and nine years. Does this mean that you want your freedom sooner? If there's any cunning plan in this proposal, it has nothing to do with escape, sir. Again, the prisoner rose and showed signs of concern. You've got the wrong impression. Just sit down and relax, and let's dispense with the sir. I'm Nikolai Ivanovich. I know from your file that you are Sergei Yurovich. You used to be a psychologist. You defended your thesis and then went into business. Your sentence was for major embezzlement, right? Yes, I was sentenced. It was back at the beginning of Perestroika, after all, Nikolai Ivanovich. You just get used to one set of laws, and suddenly new ones come out. Okay, okay. That's not the issue here. Explain to me what you have in mind with this agricultural zone with a barbed wire fence, or is there another name for it? I'll try to explain, Nikolai Ivanovich. Only it's hard for me to do that because of a particular circumstance. What circumstance? You see, we've been reading this book. It's called Anastasia. Then along came another book, a sequel. Well, anyway... The book talks about a man's purpose in life, about how if everyone living on the earth took a hectare of land and created a corner of paradise on it, the whole earth would be transformed into a paradise. The book explains this very simply and, ex and convincingly. Sounds pretty simple to me. If everyone took and created, well, then of course the whole earth would be transformed. But what's that? What's this got to do with your proposal? I'm trying to tell you. It's all outlined very persuasively in these books. Now some people might just glance over them superficially and not get everything. But we have the time. We've been reading and discussing them, and we understand them. So what have you got out of it? After reading these books, a whole lot of people have the desire to acquire their own land and create a paradise oasis in their own kin's domain. They are free. 
they can do this. So we've decided, even if it's behind barbed wire, we can still each take a hectare of land, work on it, and make it into something beautiful. By way of penalty, we suggest handing over half or even more of our produce either to the facility or to the public at large. But we do have a special request. That our plot is not taken away from us when we've served our sentence. In other words, those who want to stay on there can remain. So what does that mean? That, that you're going to live out the rest of your lives under the guard's rifle muzzles? After we've all served our sentences, you can take away the barbed wire fences and cart them off for use somewhere else, along with the towers. You can use them in another location for a new group of prisoners who want to fix up their own domains while we stay put on ours. Uh-huh. And then, when their time is up, we switch the towers and barbed wires to a third location while they go on living on their land. Is, land. is that it? You've got it. Some sort of phantasmagoria. What is it? You want me, the warden of this facility, to create paradise oasises for my prisoners? And are you certain that this can really work? I'm absolutely convinced it will be a success. As a psychologist, I'm convinced. And it's something I feel in my heart. Judge for yourself, Nikolai Ivanovich. Someone serves nine years behind bars and then walks free. He hasn't any friends. His friends are back in the prison security zone or in their cells. His family doesn't want anything to do with him. Neither does society at large. Let's face it, who will give an ex-con a decent job? Most job categories are up to their ears if, if in unemployed professionals. And look how many highly qualified people are standing in queue at employment centers. Our society provides no positions for ex-convicts. There's only one road ahead for them, back to the old routine. And so they follow it, and they end up back here with you again. Yes, I know the scenario. What's the point in merely stating the obvious? But tell me, as a psychologist, why did the cons who read this book suddenly change and go for the idea of getting a piece of land behind a barbed wire fence? Well, you see... They all got a glimpse of eternity on the horizon, like people, like people believe you're still alive, even in a prison cell. Whereas, in fact, you're not. You're dead, because there's nothing left for you on life's horizon. What were you saying about a glimpse of eternity? I told you, it's hard for me to explain right off. It's all in the books. Okay, I'll read these books and try to figure out what's, m what's made you wax so lyrical over this. Then we'll talk again. Guard, take him away. Prisoner Kodakov got up, put his hands behind his back, and asked, May I ask one more question? Go ahead, the colonel agreed. When we were working out the plan for this security zone, we, we took all existing regulations for prisoner holding into account. The proposal does not allow for any violation of these regulations. I say you've thought of everything. The regulations, no violation. I'll check it out. Then Nikolai Ivanovich ordered the guard, take him away. Subsequently, the warden called in the prisoner's legal counsel. He handed him the file and said, Here, take this. Study it thoroughly and determine where there are any violations of prisoner holding regulations. Report back to me in 48 hours. 48 hours later, the legal counsel was sitting in the warden's office. He began his report with a few evasive phrases, atypical for his profession. The thing is, Nikolai Ivanovich, that from the point of view of the law and the regulations governing the holding prisoners in so-called places of confinement, the proposal in question cannot be treated as an open and shut case. What kind of spin are you trying to give me here, Vasily? Like a lawyer in court. You and I have known each other for 15 years. Nikolai Ivanovich got up from his desk. For some reason, he appeared flustered. After pacing around the room for a while, he sat down again and continued. Tell me specifically, what have we here by the way of regulation violations? Specifically? Well, if you want it specifically, I'll have to take it one step at a time. Okay, then, one step at a time. 
We're talking about forming a new security zone here. The proposal allows for the isolation of this area from the outside world. This 100 hectare zone will be fenced off with two rows of barbed wire. Watchtowers are also provided for. The zone is secured in full accordance with regulations. The document goes on to propose the dividing of this security zone into individual plots of one hectare each and assigning each plot to a particular prisoner. Well, what is there to say? The regulations state we should accustom the unconscientious citizens in our charge to hard work, create workmanship units for basic production, as well as set up subsidiary farm and work toward partial self-financing. After all, the law allows for setting up of institutions such as ours with special provisions for economic activity and multi-purpose use of forest reserves. In our case, this proposal envis envisages the setting up of a subsidiary farm which will provide those in our charge with a supply of fresh vegetables with maybe some left over for sale. So far, we're entirely within the limits of the law. Don't draw things out. What's next? Where do we go beyond the limits? Well, next, it's proposed to construct a separate cell on each plot to provide living accommodations for the prisoner. The one the plot is assigned to work as a workspace. That's right, each one will have his own individual cell on his piece of land. The thing is, we don't have enough funds to buy regular beds, and here they're asking for a separate cell with all the amenities and furnishings. A utopia. I guess you didn't take a thorough look at all the details of the proposal, Nikolai. What do you mean, not a thorough look? I practically memorized the thing. I don't know about that. Don't know about that. But there's an attachment here giving plans and a description of the interior of this individual cell. Everything is strictly according to regulations. One bed, one toilet, one table, one chair, one bookshelf, one nightstand, a metal door with a peephole, and an exterior lock, bars on the windows. As for financing, it's spelled out here specifically. Each prisoner is responsible for funding the construction of his own individual cell. That wasn't in the document I saw. I don't know about that. Don't know about that. Take a look for yourself. It's, he it's there and the sketch, and the working drawings for the builders, and the description. What do you mean, it's there? It wasn't there when I handed you the file to go over. I distinctly remember that it wasn't. I've been over that file a dozen times from cover to cover, and here you, in two days... Yes, I did it, Kolia. I was the one. Only not in two days. They gave me a similar file three whole months ago. I recently put in my own additions and corrections, to which they agreed. Why didn't you say anything to me about this earlier? You yourself only asked for my opinion two days ago. <clears throat> okay. Let's hear what you have to say about all this. Here's what I think, Nikolai. If this proposal comes to fruition, there will be a significant decrease in the number of prisons and labor camps in the country and the crime rate will be cut in half. And you, Nikolai Ivanovich, will go down in history as a genius of a reformer. Never mind history, let's look at the nitty-gritty. Will it fly from a legal standpoint? Nikolai Ivanovich once again got up from his desk and began pacing the room. The legal counsel turned to the warden, who was still pacing the room in serious contemplation, and inquired, What are you so concerned about, Nikolai? Me? Concerned? Now, what have I got to be concerned about anyway? No, you're right, Vasily. I am concerned. I'm concerned because I can't decide what I should say about this proposal in my brief to the general. Aha, uh -huh, so that's it. So you've decided to support it after all. You've been thinking about ta taking it to the general? I've been contemplating it. I was thinking you might shoot the proposal down and persuade me not to go to see the general. That would be a weight off my shoulders. So, I guess you are in favor of it? Yes, I am. That means I've got to go, Nikolai Ivanovich concluded, in a rather cheerful tone, as though he had actually been afraid his friend might shoot the proposal down. The warden stepped over to the cupboard and took down a bottle of cognac, along with some lemon and two shot glasses. Let's drink, Vasily, to our success. Tell me, when was it that you found yourself so favorably disposed toward this file? 
<clears throat> it wasn't right away. Same here. My daughter's doing a law degree at an institute. She's in the middle of writing her graduate essay on the influence of incarceration on the eradication of criminal acts. She gave me a draft to read. I read it and just listened to what she says. 90% of those who serve their time in incarceration reoffend. The underlying cause behind these depressing crime statistics is the following. A person's upbringing, which has led them to committing the committing of a criminal act. The challenge of adapting to society following the period of incarceration. And the formation of a criminal worldview during the period of incarceration in a criminal environment. Do you realize what her conclusions mean, Nikolai? It turns out that you and I, just by honestly trying to do our duty, are actually helping shape a criminal worldview. We don't shape anything. We act in accord with regulations. The law and the orders were given. Although, you know, I too have a lurking sense of dissatisfaction here. I used to put it out of my thought. <clears throat> I've been trying to convince myself it's none of my business. But then this file appeared. I've been contemplating it for six months now, and I finally decided to go see the general. Only even though I've sat down several times to rewrite and report, rewrite a report to make it sound more intelligible, it's still not coming. Let's try to do it together. I think the main thing is not to scare the general off by making it sound too original and outlandish. We've got to simplify it. I agree, it should be simpler, but how? Especially since they're asking to have the land turned over to each prisoner for lifetime use after they've finished serving their sentence. Yes, that aspect doesn't seem realistic for the time being. We don't have any federal law at the moment on allocation of land for lifetime use. I've thought about this point. We'll have to be honest with them. When they finish serving their time, the question will be taken up at the co in the context of the land legislation in existence at that time. I think they'll understand. Everybody knows you can't go above the law. We don't make the laws, but we should also point out the direction we see things heading. Right now, it all seems to be leading to a law permitting private ownership of land. God willing, affirmed Nikolai Ivanovich as he poured out a second round of cognac. Let's just have another wee dram to success. They clinked glasses. Then, all at once, Nikolai Ivanovich put his glass down on the table and once more began pacing the room. Don't tell me you're concerned again, asked the legal counsel. You see, Vasily, Nikolai Ivanovich rattled on anxiously without pause. You and I here have been dreaming big dreams like youngsters. We've got carried away with our dreams, forgetting that we're dealing here with criminals. There are some among them, of course, that simply took a wrong turn and may be sincerely willing to get their lives back together within the limits of the law. But the majority of them are hardcore criminals, rounders through and through. They've got an entirely different agenda, and what kind of gimmick are they trying to pull here? I've thought about that too, Nikolai. But let's do a test first, and afterwards you can decide whether to report the general to the general or not. How are we going to test them? Here's how. Tell me, when did they give you this file? About six months ago. That means they've been discussing this project for more than six months now, working out the drawings and plans. Then they put it all beautifully into a folder and attached 90 application forms. So, let's you and I gather all the applicants together, suddenly and without warning, in the auditorium. We'll invite specialists, let's say agronomists, specialists, specialists in vegetable growing, and have them examine the lot. The examiners can ask questions about things like what to plant in the soil and when, and we shall see how many would-be responders there are. You know, if they're really serious about this, and they've got hold of this idea without any ulterior motives, if it's a real dream with them, they wouldn't just sit on their fannies, would they now, and wait till their proposal's answered. They'd have to be, s be studying agrotechnology. Now that's really something, Vasily. Can you imagine rounders spending half a year boning up on how to plant flowers and cucumbers? That's really steep. Maybe a chap raised in the country might know the answer, but for these? That's why I'm telling you, let's test them before deciding whether to go see the general or not. Upon entering the auditorium, they found not 90, but 200 prisoners sitting there. 
By the time the warden had invited the specialists in agrotechnology, two instructors from, instructors from the Agricultural Institute and one from the college, the number of would-be domain dwellers had reached 200 prisoners. The prisoners had taken their seats in the auditorium, not suspecting that they were, they were to be given a test. They saw the three people sitting behind the table on stage, but had no idea who they were. Then the warden came out and announced, In connection with the proposal to organize a subsidiary farm, we needed to consult people acquainted with agriculture. Anyway, I am happy to present to you three, to you three instructors from specialized educational institutions. They will be asking you questions, and after that we shall decide who among you may be entrusted with a plot of land. Nikolai Ivanovich introduced each of the three instructors in turn and invited them to put questions to the gathering. The first to ask a question was an elderly instructor from the Agricultural College seated at the right of the stage. Who among you, sirs, can tell me what time of year tomato seeds should be planted for the propagation of seedlings? When should the seedling be transplanted in the ground? And, if you're familiar with the term singling out, tell me then, please, what signs indicate the need to use it. He's got him on the run now, thought Nikolai Ivanovich, a bunch of questions all together in one. I bet even my wife, who's a veteran Dutchnik, couldn't even handle those from memory. She always checks the books before planting anything, and look how quiet everybody is, not a stir. The silence in the hall disturbed Nikolai Ivanovich. He secretly hoped that the project would actually come to fruition. The only reason he was being so picky about it was not that he wanted to reject it, but because he wanted to eliminate any flaws or defects in advance. The silence in the hall indicated that the project was being treated as less than serious by the participants most involved, which augured poorly for its chances of success. Come on now, he agonized. Not a single answer. Isn't there at least one country lad out there? Though in the country it's more often the women than the men who do the vegetable planting. To somehow compensate for the awkward pause, Nikolai Ivanovich, Ivanovich stood up from the table and said in a severe tone, What's up, lads? Didn't you get the question? We got it, replied a young prisoner seated in the front row. Well, if you got it, then answer the question. Who do you want to answer? You haven't called anyone to come to the chalkboard. What do you mean, who? What chalkboard? If anyone knows the answer, put your hand up. Instantly, all 200 prisoners present raised their hands. The examining instructor, instructors, who had been conversing amongst themselves, at once fell silent. Nikolai Ivanovich was overcome with mixed feelings. On the one hand, he felt a sense of pride in his charges, as well as a renewed hope that the project might indeed come to fruition. On the other hand, a sense of alarm over whether any of the two hundred who had raised their hand could give a satisfactory response to the question. How about you answering, he gestured to the talkative young prisoner sent, sitting in the front row. The young man got to his feet, stroking his bald head with, his tat with a tattooed hand. He began to talk quickly and volubly. The time for starting tomato seedlings will not be the same each year. It all depends on the onset of reliable frost-free weather, which of course varies from year to year. If we take into account the need to plant the seedlings in the ground before they bloom, along with the period of maturation, we can calculate the time the seeds should be planted for propagation under greenhouse conditions or on a window sill. That will do, young man, said the college instructor, interrupting the young prisoner's discourse. Put up your hand, whoever can continue. Again, two hundred hands were thrust in the air. The instructor gestured to an elderly prisoner, by all appearances an old-time criminal, with, go with a gold filling in his mouth. The old fellow quickly rose to his feet and began speaking in sedate tones. They need good, regular soil, not some kind of useless crap. You need to put in some worm-processed hummus or peat moss, but you shouldn't plant seeds directly into pure peat moss like that. They quickly get used to the peat, and then, when they're put into the garden, they, they'll be knocked for a loop. It'll be too difficult, different for them. 
So, you need to take the peat and mix it with just a bit of sand, using soil from the garden to dilute it at least by half. And you have to warm up their little earth nest for them. Say, up to about 25 degrees before sticking the seeds in the earth? That will do, the instructor interrupted. Basically, you explained everything correctly. Next one, continue. And he pointed to a decent-looking, bespectacled prisoner in the third row. So your colleague left off saying, before planting tomato seeds in the prepared soil, you have to... What do you have to do? The prisoner rose to his feet, straightened his spectacles, and continued. Before planting the seeds in the soil, you have prepared for them. You must put them in your mouth and hold them in the saliva under your tongue for at least nine minutes. The examiners seated at the table, as well as the warden, were shocked by this amazing declaration and stared at the bespectacled prisoner. After a brief pause, one of the institute instructors asked again, do you mean to say that before planting in the soil it should be moistened in water? Never in water, certainly not in chlorinated or boiled water, where all the vital bacteria are destroyed. It must be moistened in one's own saliva to infuse it with information about one's self. After it has been in man's mouth, after being in his saliva at a temperature of 36 degrees, i.e. normal body temperature, for nine minutes, the seed will awaken from its dormancy and know right off what it is to do and for whom it is to bear fruit. If a man is suffering from any ailments or abnormal abnormalities, the seed will try to bear fruit to remove such abnormalities. The three instructors held an impromptu discussion amongst themselves then turned to Nikolai Ivanovich, the college instructor queried, Who taught your charges? What institution did you invite specialists from to teach them? Even days later, the warden still couldn't figure out how he could have tripped up on answering this question. He responded this way, I don't really remember where they were from. I wasn't involved with that aspect, but I know they came from Moscow. A high-profile professor came. They realized he was trying to protect them, not letting the latest responder be made fun of by the examiners, and silently and gratefully they in turn extended their support. The young prisoner in the front row, who had been the first to respond to the question, added, We thought he wasn't just a professor, but an ac academic, and he knows a lot about the Siberian taiga, about life in general. That's right, added the pr prisoner sitting beside him. He's a real clever chap, a super scholar. From various corners of the hall could be heard rumblings of approbation of the professor from Moscow, whom none of them had ever seen in the first place. The second institute instructor, who had not spoken up to now, all at once began talking, trying to sound imposing. Yes, colleagues, I seem to remember seeing this theory somewhere myself, although I can't remember where it was. Intriguing in this, 36 degrees, actual human saliva permeated permeated with all different kinds of vital bacteria. There's definitely something to this. Yes, yes, I seem to recall it too, the colleague instructor echoed thoughtfully and in an equally grandiose manner, giving the impression that he too had heard something. This is one of the new tendencies in vegetable growing. Theoretically, of course, it is scientifically grounded, but we shall have to see how it works in practice. The prisoners seated in the hall gave fluent responses to a whole series of questions on agrotechnology. Their answers were not always of the standard variety, but the invited examiners were no longer in a hurry to offer counter-arguments. Quite the contrary, they listened with great interest. While the assistant warden went to see off the instructors, Nikolai Ivanovich sat silently at the table in front of the hushed auditorium. A deathly silence hung over the hall as he leaped through the contents of the green folder. Then the warden raised his head, surveyed the whole auditorium, and began to say, I can tell you this, lads, I still don't have a complete understanding of what you're proposing. No, not completely. So I've decided, in any case, I don't know what will come of it. I'm going to try to push it through to the central administration. The hushed auditorium, as though on command, suddenly rose to its feet and erupted in spontaneous applause. Taken completely by surprise at the reaction, Nikolai Ivanovich rose to his feet as well. 
overcome by an inexplicable embarrassment he felt a pleasant joy pleasant and joyful sensation in his heart but he managed to put on his best poker face befitting his status as a no-nonsense warden and said what's all this noise about take your seats but even as he spoke he could feel the inappropriateness of excessive severity in the given context and added we'll still have to invite the professor from moscow all the same Upon receiving Nikolai Ivanovich, the head of the Correctional Facilities Central Administration, General Pososhov, got down to business right off. It's not just you. Others, too, have been advised to upgrade their facilities, some just by five or ten places, some by as much as a hundred and fifty. You should be ready to accept an additional contingent of prisoners within a year. They'll all say it's a challenge, unrealistic, and so our prisoners are overcrowded what would you have me do here i've got an order from the justice minister to make room for an additional six thousand prisoners but you've given me cheer nikolai ivanovich i heard you say you'll be ready to receive your share and right on time yes i'll be ready only there have to be some modifications to the project as i outlined in my report i know i know i read only not everything's clear to me in your report you want to get involved in agriculture that's great. Assigning a separate plot to, eat pri to, to each prisoner? Who's stopping you? What makes you think you need my approval on this? But the notion of building a separate cell on each plot, now that does sound rather strange. It's unreasonable. Go build one or two barracks. They can march to work each morning under guard, less expensive. You'll get no additional financing for individual cells. But I'm not asking for any additional financing. What are you asking for, then? I just need you to approve the overall plan for individual cells on each plot. And where's the money going to come from to build these units? From sponsor subsidies. You must have some pretty eccentric sponsors. Look, okay then. I don't have time to go into it. I'm going to write on your proposal, review and complete. But I'll ring them up myself and tell them they should review it and complete it with due process. No delay. Is that it? There's just one minor problem. What problem? I don't have any land I can use for, subsidi for a subsidiary farm. So go see the governor. Ask him. I spoke with his deputy. They're considering, but that's all they're doing at the moment. Okay, I'll do what I can. I'll ring him up. That's it? Yes, sir. So you can proceed. All the best. Nikolai Ivanovich's facility obtained the land, 200 hectares by autumn. The land was in an isolated area, far from the nearest population point. They managed to truck in the barbed wire and five-meter-tall posts required to construct the enclosure before the seasonal rains washed out the road. Nikolai Ivanovich realized that if the enclosure wasn't ready by autumn, there was no way they could start cultivating the land on the plots the following spring. But how to get the posts into place, even if the backcountry road stopped two kilometers short of the allotted area? They wouldn't be able to get either the manpower or the equipment they needed for drilling the post holes to the designated site. When the prisoners learnt about the problem, they put forward a proposal to the warden. They would dig the post holes by hand and cross the two kilometer stretch from the end of the road to the construction site on foot under guard. Every day, even under the cold autumn rain, a convoy of 50 prisoners marched out to the site wearing homemade oilskins they had glued together from plastic sheeting. There had actually been even more volunteers, but because of a shortage of guards, only 50 could be accommodated at a time. The future landholders gave their all to their work. By the first frost, all the fence posts had been set up and connected by barbed wire, and the watchtowers erected. Back at the cell block, they constructed a, lar a log cabin for the guard at the controlled entry point and put it in place, too. The order was also submitted that autumn for the construction of the huts, individual cells for the prisoners to live in, at a cost of 30,000 rubles each. But there was no money left to pay for these. The prisoners set about raising the money where they could. Some had savings stored up from before their incarceration. Others were helped by relatives but there were few who found it impossible to raise such a sum from any source. They sent a memo to the warden, letting him know of their willingness to live in tents. But this was against regulations, and they were turned down. 
180 huts were transported to the new security zone over the winter road and set up on the piles driven in the autumn. And early in the spring, 180 prisoners were installed in these primitive huts with bars on the windows. One fine spring day, the warden stood in one of the watchtowers and surveyed the extraordinary scene before him. On the 200 hectares of barbed wire enclosure, 180 plots had been delineated, divided from each other by stakes and brushwood, with the occasional border marked by a length of stretched wire. Those are the wealthy ones, decided the warden. Their relatives must have sent them the money not just to build their cell, but for their border markings, too. Lanes and footpaths ran between the plots with a common space for meetings at the center. In some of the low-lying areas, the snow hadn't completely melted. But on the little hills, the first green blades of grass were already showing. On almost every plot, the warden could make out the dark outlines of isolated human figures. Figures which appeared faceless and identical in their warm prison jackets, cloth caps with ear flaps, and rough, artificial leather boots. What could these isolated, faceless figures possibly create on this empty ground? Why weren't they staying in their cells? The warden peered through his field glasses and focused in on one of them. It turned out to be the, to be prisoner Korokov, thrusting his spade into ground, which was still partly frozen as, as he dug another hole. Shifting his field glasses around, Nikolai Ivanovich counted nineteen holes already dug in half of the frozen ground around the perimeter of Kotakov's plot. All over the zone, figures in dark jackets were doing exactly the same thing, digging holes around the perimeter of their plots. Why so many holes, Nikolai Ivanovich wondered aloud. There for the saplings and bushes, which will grow into a green hedge surrounding each plot. The guard explained. I see. Couldn't they wait a week or two until the ground is thawed and digging will be easier? I told them as much, but they don't want to wait. They're afraid they won't get it all in, in on time. Each one has 400 meters of hedge to plant. That's no light undertaking. And once the ground thaws out, they'll have to start working on their vegetable beds. The warden spent quite a while longer observing the zeal and dexterity each of his charges displayed as they worked and he mused there must be some kind of cosmic link between the soul of a man and the soul of the earth if that link is there man is in harmony with the planet if it isn't there is no harmony corruption sets in and crime goes up of course that book anastasia must be quite exceptional all the cons have read it, and something inexplicable has erupted in their hearts. It happened with me, too. I read it, and now I've started looking at life differently. Of course, this book is playing its part. Prisoners all over the country are reading it. But the book's strength is really in how it brings out man's relationship with the earth. In other words, that relationship is primary, and one should never attempt to sever it. And all this talk about high morals and spirituality is nothing but idle chatter without this mysterious relationship, which is not yet fully comprehended. By autumn, all the plots of the new zone, as the prisoners themselves called it, were framed by still only partly grown saplings of apple trees, pear trees, rowans, birches, and all sorts of plantings which with their leaves decked out in their multicolored autumnal hues created a most pleasing picture to the eye. Approximately 1,500 to 2,000 square meters of each hectare had been planted with forest saplings. Even by that very first autumn, the view from the watchtowers over the 200 hectares below gave a distinctly different and positive impression compared to the desert-like black earth that could be seen everywhere the preceding spring. It was abundantly clear that the whole enclosure was being transformed into an exceptional oasis of green. All summer long, the new zone provided the prison cafeteria with fresh greens, then cucumbers, tomatoes, and beets. In the fall, each prisoner offered up from the plot of land entrusted to him five sacks of potatoes, along with several dozen jars of salted and canned cucumbers and tomatoes. 
The prison commissary was provided with a whole winter's supply of beets, carrots, horseradish, and other vegetables. An unusual scene took place in the autumn at the new zone's controlled entry point. In contrast to all other prison facilities in the world, where foodstuffs and other treats would be passed to the prisoners from outside, in this new zone, they were moving in the opposite direction. The soldiers handed out jars of preserved vegetables to the prisoners' relatives. Many had come by car and left with a wealth of produce in their baggage compartments. Prisoners who had not had who did not have any relatives living close by sold their part of the harvest through the soldiers to food wholesalers at a house. Nobody came to see prisoner Kotakov, however. He did not have any relatives. He had grown up in an orphanage and asked to have his portion of the harvest sent to the nearest children's home. Nikolai Ivanovich earned the administration's gratitude for a successful carrying out of their order. He was the only warden able to accept a new contingent of 180 prisoners without a worsening of holding conditions for the remainder. The past year had been the busiest one for Nikolai Ivanovich in all his 20 years of service. Apart from his usual duties, he was also responsible for prying seeds or saplings for the new zone out of whatever source he could. But he felt a shiver of delight every time he saw the old prison Zill pull up, loaded to the gills with young saplings. Five more years went by. Then, on one fine July day, a helicopter appeared and began to circle over the new zone. Nikolai Ivanovich stood at the controlled entry point and watched the helicopter fly over. He knew that on board were General Pososhkov and members of a committee dispatched by the Ministry of Justice. Perhaps someone had sent in a complaint about the warden. Or it might have been simply rumors. But in any case, word had spread about a peculiar prison-holding regime. After the helicopter had landed, the committee members, all highly placed officials, stepped out onto the open space in front of the entry point. But Nikolai Ivanovich kept standing and thinking only about the zone's security perimeter. Yes, it is clear that I shall be charged with a violation of regulations here. Why did I ever give permission for these climbing perennials to be planted around the security perimeter? They've already climbed up three meters, the full height of the barbed wire, and formed a hedge so that the wire can't even be seen behind all the different flowers. The barbed wire, you see, they didn't find it aesthetically pleasing. They even put in climbing plants and flowers around the watchtower, which have wound their way right up to the guard's lookout. Now the whole thing doesn't even look like a security zone anymore. More like some sort of a paradise oasis amidst fields overgrown with tall grasses. Here, if you please, is the first violation, already quite evident, said the general representing the ministry. What kind of security perimeter have you got here? Anyone who wants to can climb over a barrier like that, all wound around with vines, the general went on, turning to Pososhkov, the administration chief. Any soldier will tell you that, am I right? And the ministry representative addressed the lieutenant on duty at the entry point. Permission to answer, general, sir, the duty officer responded, standing to attention at his post. Answer when you're asked a question. Is there any violation of regulations here? Negative, sir, general, sir. In this instance, you are simply looking at a tactical improvement of the security perimeter of the prisoner holding zone. Well, what's that? One of the ministry committee members was taken aback. What kind of tactical improvement are you talking about? What kind of drivel is that? All the committee members stopped beside the lieutenant standing at attention. Oh, that jokester, mused Nikolai Ivanovich, feeling ultimately let down. That Lieutenant Prokhorov, again with his endless jokes. If only he could control himself in front of the committee. Now for certain they'll never pardon this ridicule. And he just stands there at attention without so much as a blush. The Lieutenant began talking, spitting out his words. Permission to answer the question on improvement, sir. Answer if you can, or ordered the general from the ministry. By tactical improvement, do you mean your flowers? Exactly, sir. 
If any criminal tries to escape by climbing over the barbed wire intertwined with flowers, he won't get very far. Why is that? asked the general in astonishment. In the process of climbing over the perimeter fence intertwined with fragrant flowers, his whole body will be infused with their scent, which means that even an experienced dog will be able to an inexperienced dog will be able to easily track him down and bring him back. So he'll be infused? The general broke out into a loud guffaw, and all the committee members joined in. And the dog will follow the scent of the flowers. Pretty nifty, Lieutenant. Imaginative. And how many escapees have your dogs brought back that way? asked the general through his laughter. Not a single one, replied the lieutenant, and continued in all seriousness. Since the criminals realized the futility of any attempt at climbing the fence, there hasn't been a single escape attempt in the past five years. The committee members felt even more exhilarated by the lieutenant's serious look and his declaration. Do you mean to say that there has not been a single attempted escape from this security zone in the past five years? The committee had asked the administration chief. That's right, not a single one, replied Pososhkov. The committee members, clearly pleased by the lieutenant's sharp-witted responses, put the following questions to him. Tell us, lieutenant, if no criminals even attempt to escape from this security zone, then why the armed soldiers in the watchtowers? To protect the zone from the outside world, replied the lieutenant. What does that mean, to protect them from the outside world? Has anyone tried to break into the zone? Affirmative, sir. The lieutenant responded, Many of the prisoners' wives have declared their wish to live with their husbands in their cells. Some of them have requested permission to spend the summer in the cells along with their children. But our strict warden, strict enforcement of regulations won't permit any such lawlessness. So a few unconscientious wives took it upon themselves to try either getting through the hedge or tunneling underneath. But all such brazen attempts have been thwarted by the zone's excellent security force. Uncertain as to whether the lieutenant was joking or speaking seriously, the committee chair inquired of Nikolai Ivanovich. Have there really been instances like this? Affirmative, replied Nikolai Ivanovich. Two such attempts have been thwarted. I received 96 applications from prisoners' wives wishing to spend the summer with their children on their husbands' plots. But apart from the conjugal meetings provided for in the regulations, nothing like this can be permitted. I wonder what it is that attracts them to the security zone, especially with the children, mused the committee chair aloud, adding, In any case, colleagues, let us go in and take a look for ourselves. Open the gates, Nikolai Ivanovich ordered the lieutenant. The wooden gates, decorated with traditional Russian carvings, quickly opened up, and the committee members entered the security zone. They had hardly gone a few paces when they all at once spontaneously stopped. Seen through the helicopter's viewports, the zone had had the appearance of a beautiful green oasis, but here on the ground it was not only the delightful footpaths of mowed grass, not only the multicolored multi living fences around the perimeter that struck the committee members. Accustomed to the odors of their offices and city streets, they were now gracefully enveloped by the delicate fragrances of summer plants and flowers. The silence was broken only by the singing of birds and the humming of insects, sounds by which no means irritated but soothed people's ears. We should visit one of the plots, said the committee chair, for some reason in a hushed tone as though afraid of disturbing the general atmosphere. The prominent officials walked up the pathway of the first plot they came to, heading for the cell hut. The little hut was actually surrounded by a metal cage though this was scarcely visible unless one examined it at close range. From a distance, it looked like a little green hillock. Wound around with various vines and surrounded by flower beds, it blended in most harmoniously with the surrounding space. At the entrance to the hut stood a man in a white t-shirt, his back to the approaching visitors. The prisoner was oiling a metal lock bolt, energetically trying to slide it back and forth. This was something of a challenge, and the prisoner was so absorbed in the task that it was a while before he became aware of his visitors. "'Hello, Karlo Mitch. Nikolai Ivanovich greeted him. "'Make our guests feel at home. Introduce yourself.' Karlo Mitch quickly turned about, 
After momentarily losing his bearings upon seeing visitors, he quickly regained his composure and introduced himself. Prisoner Karlamik, sentenced according to the Article 102 of the Criminal Code of the Russian Federation to 12 years, served six years in the cell block, five years now in the new zone. And what have you been doing here with your door? asked the committee chair. I've been oiling the exterior bolt, chairman, sir. It started sticking quite a bit. The metal they produced today is not very good quality. It rusts quickly. The committee chair went over to the door leading into the cell, closed it, and tried shoving the bolt into position. It didn't budge on the first attempt, but he finally got it to work. Then he turned, and, with a meaningful glance to the administration chief, Pos Pososhkov declared, So, you claim you're following all the regulations for prisoner holding to the letter. Does that mean after completion of their work day, they're all locked up in their cells? The administration chief was silent. Everyone realized that the metal bolt had rusted and was hard to budge for the simple reason that it had not been used for a long time. Prisoner Karlamik realized that he had let his superiors down, and thoughts began running through his head. I should have fixed this damn bolt a long time ago. How can I explain to these people that this lock is completely unnecessary? Nobody here would even think of leaving the zone of running away from his land. To what purpose? Where would they go? As for Karlamik, here was his native space, here was his motherland. It was here that he was greeted every morning by the singing of birds and the waving of the branches of trees he himself had planted. He had been raising a little goat which he had named Nikita, along with a dozen laying hens and had a couple of beehives. Others had their own homesteads, setting them up just a little differently, but for each one it was his own homestead, on his own piece of land, and here he had gone and let down his warden with this damn bolt. Karlamik was really upset. He began talking quickly and excitedly. I'm the world's worst son of a bitch when it comes to this bolt, Chairman Sir, and I have no excuse if it should reflect badly on my buddies. Only I want you to understand. Let me have one last word here. Let me tell you. My whole life has changed. Not even changed. In fact, my life has just begun in this place. I am free here. Out there, outside the gates, there is no freedom there. Indeed, that's where all hell breaks loose. The soldiers up there in the watchtower, they're like angels to us. We, we pray that they don't let any scum in here. The prisoner's voice, with its heart-wrenching emotion and the content of what he had to say, worked its own unique effect on the people standing by. All at once, one of the committee members, a woman deputy from the state Duma, suddenly burst out. What's all the fuss over this measly bolt? Don't you see it rained last night? The bolts started shriveling. The committee chair glanced at the metal bolt, then at the woman, and burst out laughing. Shriveling, you say? Why didn't I think of that before? It did rain, after all, and the bolt began to shrivel and it rusted. And up in the towers, those are angels, you say? Angels, Karlamik echoed. Tell me, when is your time up? In eleven months and seven days. How do you propose to live after that? I've applied to have my sentence extended. What? How could it be extended? Why? Because out there there's no freedom. There's no order in that kind of freedom. There's no freedom without land. And who's stopping you from going free, getting a piece of land and creating the same kind of homestead that you have here, only as a free man? You could get yourself a family. You know, Chairman, sir, that's something I'll never understand. Who is stopping us here in Russia from giving each Russian a hectare of land? I'll never understand. Does Russian land belong to Russian, Russians or not? Right now, according to the law adopted by the State Duma, everyone has the right to buy land, observed the woman deputy. And what if I don't have the money to even buy a single hectare of land? Does that mean I have no motherland? That's the way it looks. I don't have it and I never will have it. But if Russia is my motherland, just who am I supposed to buy it from? It turns out somebody seized my motherland for themselves, the whole country, down to a single hectare, and is now demanding a ransom from every last Russian. There's some monkey business going on here, beyond the law and beyond our understanding. You, Chairman, sir, Karlamik addressed the committee chair, I see by your stripes that you're a general. So liberate our motherland from whoever seized it and is demanding a ransom. 
Or are you too going to be paying a ransom for your own little piece of mo the motherland? Prisoner Karlamik, cease and desist, Nikolai Ivanovich intervened. He could see the scar on the war-wounded general's cheek turning purple and his fists clenching. The general stepped up to the prisoner. They stood staring at each other in the eye, without a word between them. And then the general quietly said, Show me around your homestead, Russian citizen, and added even more quietly, almost to himself, your piece of the motherland behind barbed wire. Karlamik showed the committee members around his young garden, with its budding fruit on the branches. He treated them to currants and raspberries. He showed them the tomato beds, along with the more than 200 square meters he had planted with cucumbers. He showed them the pond he had dug himself with a spade. Standing beside the pond was a neatly arranged row of barrels. Karlamik has a particular know-how here, Nikolai Ivanovich explained to the committee members, pointing to the barrels. He salts away a 150-liter barrels of cucumbers every year. He's developed a superior, first-rate pickling method, and he's invented an original preservation system. First he fills each barrel with cucumbers and brine. Then he cocks them and stores them in the pond, under water. They'll keep that way until the spring. As soon as the restaurant wholesalers arrive from Moscow, Karlamik, Karlamik chops a hole in the ice and drags out a barrel over to the entry point. We sell them at 500 rubles a barrel. Karlamik gets 250, and the rest goes to the prison coffers. And how much does each enterprise make annually for your facility, inquired one of the committee members. On average, around 100,000 rubles a year, responded Nikolai Ivanovich, though, according to contract, half of it goes to the workers on the plots. 100,000? The committee member was astonished. And you've got here 180 hectares, all told? That means you have a net profit of 90 million a year from them. Yes, that's right. And the prisoner each make 50,000 a year? Yes, that's how it works out. In the whole country, we've got over a million citizens being held in incarceration. What if we switch them all over to such a system? What a tremendous source of income for the country. Plus, the number of criminals, judging from what we can see, would significantly decrease. Switch over all of them? Another committee member broke into the conversation. But we're facing quite a different question here. This zone may even be closed down. Why... Why were we brought here anyway? To find out what's really happening. There's something funny going on here. Prisoners living in better conditions than people at liberty. And these prisoners, no matter how you put it, are criminals. Anyway, what are you going to do, Nikolai Ivanovich, Ivanovich when these people's terms are up? The warden answered without hesitation. If I had my way, I would let every last one of them look after their own plot. I would take down the barbed wire and move it somewhere else, start setting up a new zone. In their report to the Ministry of Justice, the committee members reported that they found no violations of regulations on prisoner holding. What about these rumors that the prisoners are living in better conditions than many free citizens, asked the minister. Then it is the lives of our free citizens that have to be improved, the committee chair observed. We need to give people land, not lip service, but in actual fact. But that's not within our jurisdiction, said the minister, dismissing the proposal. Let's get right to the essentials. In terms of essentials, it comes down to this. We need to replicate this experience in all the facilities under our jurisdiction, the committee chair stated firmly. I second that, affirmed the woman deputy, adding, and I fully intend to introduce a bill in the Duma to grant every Russian family a hectare of land for lifetime use whereon to establish their own kin's domain. The Duma passed the law. At one swoop, millions of Russian families began planting gardens and little forests in their own family lands, and Russia flores, flourished. In what year did this happen? What? It hasn't happened yet? Why not? Who's stopping us? Who is preventing Russia from flourishing? Chapter 27 a law for deputies elected by the people. I realized that Anastasia's grandfather possessed not only extraordinary psychoanalytic abilities, but also information about the societal structure of various nations. 
but I wondered how specific his knowledge was about the state institutions. After all, here he was, living out in the taiga, without access to radio, telephone, or television. So how could he get information, let's say, about our national government agencies? There was no way, which meant he did not have any specific information. Still, I decided to ask him. You know that in our Russian state there is a body known as the State Duma? I know, came the reply. And do you know who works there and how it functions? I know that too. And do you have information on each deputy? Yes, on every single one. And the laws they pass, is that something you know about too? Not only about the laws they pass, but about the laws they will pass in the future. I know about them in advance. But again, why are you so surprised, Vladimir? For a priest, that is the simplest of tasks. It's not all that interesting. Yes, I am surprised, because I don't understand how you can possibly know about every single single deputy, let alone what, the law, what laws the Duma is going to pass in the near future. It's some sort of inexplicable mysticism. There is no mysticism here, only the most primitive of tasks. Well, could you explain this phenomenon to me? The depth of information you have, I mean. I can, of course. It's really all very simple. You see, back five thousand years ago, the pharaohs had their council. In the Roman Empire, there was the Senate. The Tsars had the Boyars Duma. Now, what can I say more? The names may be different, but the essence is always the same. After all, the law doesn't depend on how a legislative body is named, but on what influences parliamentary delegates are subjected to, on the living conditions surrounding, surrounding them, and the perspectives for the future to which they are, about, they are bound. But all the conditions were pre-programmed for them a long time ago. If one knows the program, one knows what's ahead as well including what decisions the legislators are capable of reaching. What do the law and the deputies' living conditions have to do with it? How are they connected with a broader program? Anyway, what can you yourself possibly know about how a modern Duma deputy lives? It's very simple, of course. I'm not talking about how any particular deputy sleeps, what they eat, or how they dress. That's not something I care to know. Nor do I find it int of interest. I'm talking about what's significant. I'm sure it's the same now as in earlier times. People are elected as deputies only after going through a whole lot of wheeling and dealing. That's fact number one. In their striving for power, many of them fall into the hands of those who are in control of the material world. But after going through all their trials and tribulations, they find themselves in a tight spot. The program is always attempting to cut them off from significant information, and generally succeeds in doing this. What perks does the deputy receive? I think, I'm sure, that today, just as before, he gets an individual office, a new place to live, along with, nowadays at least, a car. Not to mention two or three assistants. Some get more than that. Yes, that's more or less it, I confirmed. Are you trying to say that all this fits in with a program worked out millennia ago? Of course it does. But wait, let me finish. Tell me if I'm mistaken about what happens today. Apart from that, I believe that just like a whole lot of people, deputies have to go to work each day. They have to be present at Duma sittings and make laws. Yes, you're right. And each one serves for a set term. Four or five years. It's four at the moment. Okay, four. When their term is up, they have to be re-elected. But even before the next election, they're all thinking about it. Quite right. Hold on there. How do you know that? Think how surprised you were when I told you I know what laws are going to be passed. And now you claim you know how deputies think about the future? Their future? What, have you suddenly become clairvoyant? Or a celebrated prophet? Nothing of the sort. Any fool would know this. If election time is coming up, then anyone wanting to be re-elected will be thinking about it and taking appropriate action. Slow down there. Note what you just said. Thinking about re-election. Yes, that's what I said. But surely deputies should be thinking about new laws. Of course. They're thinking about them at the same time. 
when, at what time of the day. In short, believe me, the program doesn't leave them any time for thinking. For ages now, as you too well know, the people have been choosing parliamentary delegates on the expectation that they will, that they will then pass wise laws. What the people don't understand is that their basic program does not allow them to think. Think about this yourself sometime. I did subsequently think about this situation, over and over again, in fact, and truly our traditional laws on the election and duties of Duma deputies began to seem more and more absurd. Let's take a more detailed look at the practice as it has evolved up until now. Let's say a relatively smart fellow, above average, that is, has decided to stand for office. He wants to participate in passing wise legislation that will help people lead a good life. In running the gauntlet of an election campaign, he is very likely to find himself dependent on fundings. Some become more dependent than others. This is in no way means that someone from the world of the wealthy offers financial assistance to every single candidate in return for future considerations. It is enough to point out the various levers that can be moved with the help of money. We are shown this in the press and on TV through stories about so-called dirty technology, but we watch it all through the eyes of an outside observer. On the other hand, the actual participants in election campaigns are far from being outside observers. They know what it's like to be the target of smear tactics. Even if you haven't experienced it yourself, you can, of course, well imagine what kind of weapons can be used against you when big money is involved. A defensive reaction is only natural. You have to cover your behind at all costs. And behind you, in this case, is some pretty big money. So you have to tie yourself for safety's sake to some kind of solid financial shore. Or as people say today, to the oligarchs. An alternative is to throw your fortunes in with some political party. It doesn't really matter which one, you're still going to have to pay off your debts to them later. And what about wise laws? Ah, yes. It is simply a question of no appropriate conditions having ever been created to facilitate them. Of course, deputies do enjoy a host of perks, including parliamentary immunity with law enforcement agencies. But the question still remains. If you put the deputies' perks on one side of the scale and the intensity, scheming, and stress associated with their work on the other, it's anybody's guess as to which will win out. There is another paradoxical circumstance. The history of mankind has never known a single individual, a single super wise man capable of making only and exclusively wise decisions hour after hour, day in and day out. It is no secret that even prominent rulers and regimental commanders occasionally make mistakes. The deputies' work schedules are arranged in such a way that they have sittings every single day. Not only that, but daily sittings for several hours a day. At each sitting, they are supposed to pass a number of legislative bills relating to different, different spheres of human life. History has shown that the adoption of wise legislation is either impossible under such an overloaded work schedule, on either a theoretical or practical plane. It is impossible because of the lack of time for contemplation. Nevertheless, this absurd order of things is what prevails in most countries on the various con continents of the globe. Who instituted it? Well, it must have instituted itself, many might think. But there's no way that could have happened. It's too carefully thought through and goal-specific. Besides, for some reason, it is not being discussed in any meaningful way. You can argue as cogently as you like for its destructive nature. You can prove its, its destructive nature scientifically with the help of psychoanalysts. That, of course, is important, but it's not the main thing. The main thing is, what's the alternative? But there is nothing in the way of an alternative on the horizon. Indeed, who would even have one come to mind when such a phenomenon has practically become the norm in almost all countries? 
But since Anastasia's grandfather was the first to raise this question, and since he was familiar with the work of bodies similar to our current legislative assembly over the course of thousands of years, it was possible he might be able to suggest an alternative. And so I inquired, well, could you suggest your own ideal version of how elections should be run and how legislators should subsequently proceed in organizing their work? And this is what I heard in reply. There's no point in talking about the elections themselves until the deputies' working and living conditions are changed. And what kind of working and living conditions, in your opinion, should there be? First of all, the deputies need to be taken away, at least for part of the time from their artificial information field. They need to be supplied with nourishment capable of sustaining the complete functioning of the brain. An image needs to be created which attracts the respect of society, and which any deputy cannot fail to follow. What does it mean to create an image? Judging by what you told me about today's deputies, their outward trappings suggest that the public has formed a negative image of government officials in general, and elected deputies in particular. Yes, generally speaking, the public does have a pretty negative image of them. That's very bad. People build up negative thought forms regarding their deputies, and so what happens is that they themselves make them negative. An image is the most powerful, concentrated energy of a large number of people. And how are people to think of them positively if their own life doesn't improve? You see, we've got what amounts to a closed circle here. Each time you elect those who seem to be the best people for the job, but then, no sooner are they elected than you start calling them the worst people. But just how do we get this out, get out of this vicious circle? For the past 5,000 years, there has been no better way than the one proposed by Anastasia, and there won't be in the foreseeable future. What do you have in mind here? Land. She said we need to give, to give each willing family at least a hectare of land for lifetime use, whereon to establish one's own kin's domain. But she didn't say anything about parliamentary deputies. In actual fact, she specified every willing family. Don't deputies have families? Indeed they do. So why not start with them? The public would say that's going too far. They've got enough perks as it is. You need to explain to the public on whose behalf this step is being taken. They need to know what the most favorable conditions are for passing the legislation the public expects. But on what basis should the deputies be granted land? On special terms or the same as for everyone else? The same as for everyone else, though not exactly. Every deputy should be allotted at least 150 hectares of land on which a new type of community will be established, according to the principles Anastasia talks about. Of the 150 acres granted for lifetime use, the deputy may keep one for himself, as long as his family is small and no additions are in the offing. In cases where the deputy has children who are already forming their own families and they want to set up domains of their own, a hectare should be set aside for each of his children's families. Thus, the deputy himself will end up with one or three or five hectares of land, depending on the size of his family. And what about the remaining hectares? You mentioned 150 all told. 30% of the remainder he can give away to whomever he likes. But after that, the plot should be offered to people from different social st strata. Soldiers, academics, artists, entrepreneurs, and so forth. In each community, one or two hectares should be definitely set aside for refugees and children from orphanages. But two deputies should not be given land in the same community. So what then, if each deputy has his own family domain? Does that mean that the law will get better right away? Of course they will. Our country will have the wisest laws in the world. How so? At the moment, deputies spend long periods of time in their offices and at parliamentary meetings, cut off from the public. At the moment, they do not receive any gratitude for their good laws or censor for bad ones. At the moment, following their natural inclinations, they try to provide for the material well-being of their families. 
After their term of office is up, they may change their place of residence and even move to another city or another country where nobody will repro reproach them or hound them for any violation of expected norms. A change of residence or country will not affect their financial status. As long as they have money, they can go wherever they like and find shelter, food, and clothing. But money won't be able to buy them a kin's domain of their own, a piece of their motherland. Today, the concept of motherland is terribly distorted. <coughs> motherland is nothing but a territory someone has defined by borders. But when you stop to think of it, one's motherland always begins with one's family land and extends to encompass all the people who are of a kindred spirit to you. Those who begin to establish their own domains will obtain their motherland in perpetuity. This is the greatest tragedy for one's family. It is not their laws or their morality that will prevent deputies from making wrong decisions, but their kin's domains. And for people who have their motherland, money will lose its primary importance. Only in his kin's domain can man obtain the complete range of nutrition he needs, including nourishment for the proper functioning of the brain. But this is extremely important for people who have a lot of thinking to do. The sittings of the State Duma should run no more than three days a week. The rest of the time, the deputies should spend in their kin's domain, a place where they can really think things through and lay the real groundwork for the making of laws. The deputies' wives should not be employed in any position that is not connected with their husband's work. The family domains will shield deputies, at least for a time, from the influence of artificial information coming from the artificial world. It will facilitate the thinking process. In the case of the great philosophers, great thoughts were always born in conditions of solitude and not during public speeches. And what if some of the deputies are unwilling to accept land and refuse to set up their own family domains? This is where we come to the election of public representatives. If any deputy refuses to set up a family domain, the public should not re-elect him for a subsequent term. Even though he holds citizenship in the country where he was elected, in reality he is a foreigner. He doesn't need this motherland. And no matter what good things he said about are said about him, his actions, in fact, will bring no good to the people. But once they know that voters will give preference to candidates who have a family domain, some deputies may just take the land and erect their own palace-like mansions on it, along with tennis courts and brick walls, and won't plant any trees or gardens or living fences Anastasia recommended. What then? Then they will show what they're really made of. But here, too, people will be able to make the right choice. Why do you think every man in Rus was endowed with a patronymic? Back in the early days of Rus, a man would introduce himself by saying, I am Ivan from Nikita's domain, citing the name of his father or grandfather who had established his kin's domain. In other words, the domain was something to be proud of. In referring to it, a man would describe himself, as well as his character and abilities, in the fullest possible manner. Anyone who could not point with pride to his domain was considered an outcast. The more Anastasia's grandfather went on about the kin's domains, the more distinctly the joyful picture of our country's future became etched in my consciousness. Can you just imagine? Imagine! 360 deputies of our state Duma, each taking 150 hectares of land and organizing 360 marvelous new style communities. Each deputy will then be showing not just in his words, but in his actions, what he's capable of achieving. And Russia will bear witness to the first 360 oases in which Russian Federation citizens will begin to live in actual human conditions. Then these deputies will pass legislation, and naturally there will not be a single law harmful to the environment. They will pass laws guaranteeing the right of each citizen to obtain his own small piece of motherland. They will stand up for this right because each of them will have their motherland. Chapter 28 To the Readers of the Ringing Cedars Series my dear readers, 
I thank you heartily for your understanding and moral support. I thank all who have openly expressed their thoughts in internet communications and the almanac, who have tried to organize discussions of the ideas outlined in the Ringing Cedars series through letters to the press. My thanks to you, scholars of Russia, first and foremost, Boris Minin, who openly appeared on the stage of the Pod Mov Moskov's concert hall, which with his evaluation of Anastasia's ideas. A special note of gratitude is due the fine actor, distinguished artist of Russia, Alexander Mikhailov, who took part in the conference. My thanks also to the economist Dr. Viktor Medikov, who has written a number of papers on his research of the ideas expressed in the books, and to Anatoly Eriomenko, active member of the Academy of Pedagogical Sciences for his marvelous poetry. To a deity, age and health and sloth, all notwithstanding, here I am before you on knee bending, simply cause I've seen you from afar, life's renown, a deity you are. Instantly you scattered all illusions, rising from dark forces, sly intrusions. Your depiction of a bright future, of a future bright, helped me banish sorrow's fearsome night. In you I see man's true being ascending, possibly another age is ending, where my granddaughters, just like a muse, will embody you and your bright views. Though at heart I quietly resist, every time you say, I exist. Tis no sin to talk of your appearing in a place where others might be hearing. Therefore send I from my heart a gleam, rays of warmth to you, my living dream. And in nighttime vision, or tomorrow, in the taiga I shall see your shadow. To the elders of Russia, O oh, you wise-hearted elders of Russia, have you nothing to lone hearts to say? For the blue eyes that grow ever lusher will still shine o'er the world with their ray. They will waken dull tribes and refresh them with humanity's flourishing wave. If there's no other means of expression, a tall cedar to chips she will shave and in secret will give them, like mana, to all people eternity bound, and will call us with this unknown mana to the place where our future is found. With our knees now already unbended and our back straight and tall and so proud, all our worries and idle contentment we forsake not tomorrow but now. Let us still hear the voice of the ages that has whispered to us as a friend. You are singular children of nature. Death and treason do not spell your end. Nor do mud slingings, furry unleashings, nor do stone walls or home destroying hail. But for those who accept the true teaching, their connection with nature won't fail. We are given a power immortal from the earth gods and God high above, by a heavenly hand incorporeal that our hearts may awaken to love. Let us all then, as singular brothers, with our heart strings stretched taut in a bow, now extend our embrace to all others, send our ray out wherever we go. Then in spring, over all the earth's nations, all the cherry tree gardens will bloom. For humanity's new generations, there will be no more danger or doom. O oh, you wise elders, sons of Russia, do not slacken, but say the word true. May the joy of dear Anastasia now shine forth in its heavenly blue. I thank Viktor Pavlovich Garkovitz, Gar the superintendent of the education for the city of Kharkov, as well as the instructors, workers, and administration of the tractor factory in this Ukrainian city for organizing a fantastic meeting with my readers. My thanks, too, to all the organizers of readers' conferences in other cities. 
Thank you, Russian immigrants in Germany and Canada. Thanks to the bards who have written more than 500 songs now, and the artists who sent in their pictures. They are, they are already posted on the site www.anastasia.ru. And the best of them have been published in the Almanac, the Ringing Cedars of Russia. One of their works may be seen on the cover of the of the present volume, the Russian original of the present volume. My thanks go out to the tens of thousands of people who have expressed their appreciation for my books in their sincere and inspired letters. I thank you all for your open support. Without it, it would be a lot harder for me to write. However, I would like to share with you, especially with those public figures who are only just contemplating coming out with their support of Anastasia's ideas, the following points. You should understand that there is a considerable opposition to these ideas, a planned and organized opposition. It is still not completely clear specifically who is spreading the false rumors and what levers of power they are using. You should be aware of this so that you can determine for yourself whether it is worth it to you to openly support the ideas outlined in these books. I know firsthand how unpleasant all the slander and provocations have been, but it is many times harder for me when they are directed against you, my readers, all the more so when they are personalized and intensive, as, for example, the attacks against the children and teachers of the academic Shetanen school. I wouldn't want any others to be subjected to similar attacks. I'm not merely convinced. I now know for absolute certain that the ideas outlined by Anastasia are irreproachable. Their materialism, materialization, can, of course, be temporarily held back, but they will still be revived in human beings with ever-increasing force. From where I stand, the most vital and important steps required today are the following. First, organization of schools, courses, and seminars at the local level. It is vital to adapt general designs of family domains and communities to specific locales. You need to study the healing properties of herbs and plants growing in your area in particular. You need to know exactly which vegetables and fruits will grow under natural conditions in your climate. You need to prepare working designs specified down to the minutest detail for your family domains and communities. Second, you need to bring in specialists who have a good understanding of what is happening and plug them into work on creating a program of development for the Russian Federation. This should be a universal program capable of solving all the problems of orphans, refugees, and low-income families through the idea of establishing kin's domains. The security and well-being of each family will ensure the security and well-being of the nation as a whole. It is vital to flesh out the details of your dream. Then it will most certainly come true. Let every person do as much as they can along this line, starting from their own resources. We should see the birth of dozens, hundreds of designs for kin's domains and communities. Designs for the economic, ecological, and spiritual development of individual regions of the whole nation. You know, when I first saw Anastasia, she was standing on the shore of the Siberian River Ob. She was wearing an old long skirt and a quilted jacket, with a kerchief on her head and rubber galoshes over her bare feet. This taiga recluse looked like an unassuming and lonely woman. But today I have the impression that it was our Russia that was standing there in the Siberian wilds with her rubber galoshes over her bare feet. It was our dream of the future that was standing there so lonely on the deserted Siberian riverbank. But now it is within us. And the time will most certainly come when our dream will stride openly and free in a beautiful ball gown across all of Russia, and not just across Russia. The greatest energy in this dream is the energy of life. To be continued. Read to you by Nicole. February 2020.